hope because everybody else is on mute. That's fun. You sound good. All right, thank you. So good morning, welcome to large event planning at the local level. This is David Patton, Kasuth County Emergency Management Coordinator from Kasuth County. Um, I will be presenting with my counterpart, Jeff Anderson from Marion County. So we welcome everybody and uh, we heard this morning that there's not gonna be an introduction. So we're just gonna go ahead and kick it off. Um, I think the housekeeping stuff is if you have any questions, uh, hopefully if we have time at the end, we'll. Will, uh, Blake will allow us to open up for audio. Otherwise, type in your questions in the chat. So uh, we'll just start out uh, with a little introduction of ourselves um, and see where we're coming from. So uh, again, this is David Petten. Uh, I'm a 2000 grad from Algona High School here uh, in the great county of Kasuth County. Um, uh, I graduated, like I said, in 2000, started my career in public safety in 1999 when I became uh, an EMT here for our local ambulance service um, and, and have stuck with, stuck with EMS uh, and other public safety activities um, moving forward. Uh, brief stint in the Department of Corrections in South Dakota as a senior correction officer, um, which I, I did enjoy. That was interesting. I worked death row, ad seg, and disciplinary. Uh, when it comes to the emergency management profession, uh, when I started full time in uh, 2013, um, I was really open for a change. My body wasn't handling the, the late night, early morning ambulance calls and the lifting of 300 pound patients anymore. Um, so I was looking to slow down a little bit. So I thought the fool that I am. Um, uh, when it came to what I thought emergency management was, uh, I started out by, by depending greatly on existing plans um, and those plans that, that were in place that uh, my predecessor had, I reviewed very slowly and felt that they were, they were good. Uh, but as the years passed, I started to see that um, my thought process for this did not work and it, uh, uh, it did catch me off guard and it was a big failure on my part. Uh, as Kasuth County experienced smaller events, flooding, wind damage, uh, things of that sort, and as I watched uh, the state and region with their larger events, it prompted me to look deeper into the plans and reach out to my counterparts in my district. We conducted more tabletop exercises uh, as we're directed to, and I involved more of our partners around the county uh, and around our district. So it was very nice to be able to pull in that expertise um, and move forward. Uh, so with that, I, you know, I will acknowledge that I am totally preaching to the choir here, so I apologize for that. Um, again, when I started my career in emergency management, I thought that uh, my mantra was fake it till you make it, uh, we'll get there. Uh, but again, I quickly adopted a new phase or a new, uh, new phrase that I want um, to share with you. And uh, what my mantra now is, surround yourself with people you know, so that you can make the best informed decisions or recommendations that you can, and be confident to stand behind those decisions, right or wrong. You're not alone in this. Um, so that's a little bit about myself. I'll kick it over to Jeff to introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. Appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to be with us this morning. Um, so I've been the emergency management director in Marion County since 2008. Uh, first day on the job was May 1st. Um, within two hours of being here, um, had a police pursuit around the courthouse where my office was at the time, um, culminated with a wreck involving the bad guy and then uh, three officers involved in a shooting with that subject and then ultimately a pipe bomb located in his car same day so that was my first day on the job um, 20 29 days later we had an uh, f2 tornado hit one of our small unincorporated villages just south of knoxville so it was really baptism by fire and has been kind of a ride since um, my public safety experience started in 1987 as a volunteer firefighter, then went on to become an EMT. Um, retired from that a few years ago, still serving as a volunteer firefighter here in, in Knoxville with one of the small departments. Um, had several disaster declarations here since I've been in the office. Um, like I said, been a wild ride. Uh, gotten to know most of you, gotten to um, learn from you and much appreciate that opportunity, those opportunities. Um, Dave, let's go ahead and get started. All right, thanks, Jeff. So again, preaching to the choir, 
uh, I found this this quote very uh, very pertinent to the the life we're living right now. So if we take a moment and look at this quote that we have, if you believe you could accomplish everything by cramming at the eleventh hour, by all means, don't lift a finger now. But you may think twice about beginning to build your ark once it has it all once the rain has already started. You guys, this kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? Isn't it? Uh, very similar to what we've been hearing since March. We're building this plane mid-flight. My friends, we know uh, and have known a long time that a global pandemic was possible, did we not? We look all the way back at history from the beginning of times, from 430 BC in Athens, it's the first noted pandemic. 165 AD is the Antonian Plague. 541 AD, the Justinian Plague. 11th century leprosy, 1350 Black Death, 1817 Cholera, 1918 the Great Spanish Flu, 1957 Asian Flu, 1981 we start to see the HIV AIDS pandemic or issues, H1N1, SARS outbreak in 2003, Ebola, and now here we find ourselves 2019-2020 with COVID-19. Why were we not prepared? Why are we building this plane mid-flight? You know, this is something, uh, again, that we knew was coming, and uh, we really allowed ourselves to be caught off guard here. So the two events that we're going to be talking about, uh, with that said, um, are the two large events that uh, our counties host. So uh, for me here in Kasuth County, we host annually over the 4th of July weekend the Abate Freedom Rally. This Freedom Rally is hosted by uh, the Abate of Iowa, so uh, a motorcycle organization. Um, and then we're going to talk about Marion County's uh, event that they host yearly would be the Tulip Festival. So Jeff and I are going to bounce back and forth off each other as we go through this. So uh, for anybody that doesn't know a whole lot about uh, the Abate Freedom Rally, I've, I've posted a few pictures on here that we're going to scroll through. And then we're going to go a little video and then we're going to go away from the slides and just kind of speak informally. Um, but I do have a disclaimer again. So anybody that knows anything about the abate rally, um, it's, uh, it's a celebration of freedom in every way that you can think of, every way you can imagine. So if by chance in the pictures and the videos that, that I will show, I apologize if there is something that... Um, maybe as offensive or disturbing in the images there. So our objectives through this presentation, um, we want to give a brief history, what the event is and a brief history of the events that we host. We want to talk about the normal planning. We want to talk about planning in 2020 with COVID um, events. Uh, and of course, during this year, we can't leave out the civil unrest. We want to touch on the events of 2020 and we want to share our lessons learned. So we're going to start out with the Abate Freedom Rally. So Abate, uh, Abate Freedom Rally is an event that's held over the 4th of July weekend. This uh, usually runs Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Those are the official days that it's held. However, people start gathering uh, as early as the weekend before the 4th of July weekend. So we begin to see the influx in visitors to Kasuth County uh, that lasts a little over a week, week and a half. This event is held on a properly, property that is privately owned. It's 165 acres in size. The event draws anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 motorcycle enthusiasts from around the world to celebrate this event, to uh, celebrate their freedoms. Uh, this slide here shows a, a map. Uh, most of this area here is, is camping, um, and then there's uh, some stages and things of that sort around. So, I don't know if you guys could see my mouse, but this is the main stage area here. Um, and I'll have some photographs on the next slide that kind of show how the gatherings go with that main stage area. I guess it'd be the slide after this. So what ABATE is, uh, ABATE stands for a brotherhood aimed towards education. Now when ABATE started, uh, it actually stood for a brotherhood against totalitarianism. You know, so this, this group started because they didn't want to be told they had to do anything. They celebrate their freedom, just as this freedom rally says. So uh, as we became a kinder, gentler society, 
they change their, their name to a brotherhood aimed towards education. They work uh, for motorcycle enthusiasts. They provide uh, motorcycle education, um, discussing laws. Uh, and for anybody in the, uh, the EMS, law enforcement, fire profession, um, there's a, a program called Two Wheel Trauma that Slider Gilmore and his brother go out and do. So this is one that's, um, uh, I think most of us are probably familiar with. It is a neutral organization that allows all riders to unite in this brotherhood. Um, and it, it believes, especially here in Iowa, believes that motorcycles, mo motorcyclists are brothers with a common interest, the safety of riders um, and so on. So this picture here is just a little taste of the Freedom Rally. Uh, this is uh, opening parade of bikes. Um, you know, you, you'll see that the, the gathering has started. They camp in their areas. Um, and they, they ride their, their bikes through the flags there. So they really truly celebrate their freedoms. This is a photograph. Uh, these three photographs are actually the rally, 4th of July weekend, 2020. So the picture on the left is the main stage. Picture on the upper right, that is uh, during what's called a cool down contest. And then obviously the picture on the right is drone footage so you could see what it's in there. So I think we can all say we see the social distancing there, right? It was incredible. Got a little video here. I, if it works, I give you just a little taste of the rally here. And if it doesn't, I apologize. <laughs> just a little ride through the abate grounds um, you know obviously you could see the the number of people that gather um, 
towards the end of the video, it showed uh, that main stage. You could really see uh, the way they gather in there. Activities that occur at the, the Abate Freedom Rally annually, um, they host their own little activities in there. So looking at that map, there's areas in there that they call uh, Beer Can Alley, um, Heroin Row, uh, the Booze Barn, the stages, you know, they've got their, their different areas and, you know, based on what they're named, that's kind of the group they gather in there. So at the rally, they, they do sled poles. So we're looking at uh, some real interesting kind of traumatic events that happen there. They've got their rides, their parade, fireworks. There's five stages for live music that go on uh, pretty much throughout the entire rally. Bike games, tattoo contests, mud wrestling, midget bowling, bike show, rodeo, cool down contest, which is kind of wet t-shirt contest-ish, uh, party foam pit, burnout pit, vendors, and food and beer and booze, and more beer and booze, and beer and booze. Uh, just kind of goes on like that through the weekend. Uh, so we'll get in more to that here in just a moment. So Jeff's going to talk a little bit about the Tulip Festival. Okay, thanks Dave. So the Tulip Festival, i um, guessing quite a few of you have probably at some point in your life has been to Pella during the Tulip Festival. Um, it's held typically the first weekend in May, um, begins on Thursday and runs through Saturday. Um, the festival is focused around the planting, the annual planting of in excess of 300,000 tulips that uh, a lot of effort is made to make sure that the tulips are blooming at just the uh, most opportune time um, during the festival. Um, typically, um, we see crowds over the three days of around 150,000 people. Um, just a couple years ago, they set a new record. Um, they were in excess of 200,000 people. Um, the festival itself is centered around um, a lot of outdoor entertainment, uh, a couple parades run each day, outdoor uh, music, and a lot of food vendors. Um, so it was, it was, it was interesting for this year. Um, the, the reason that I'm actually presenting, I want to get this out there. The reason I'm presenting on this piece is because most of you are probably scratching your head going, well, the Tulip festival did not happen. It was canceled due to COVID-19. And, and it was, it was actually canceled on March 17th. Um, we began kind of uh, full-time COVID response efforts here the week prior. So this was very early in, in our response. Um, so what I'm going to be discussing is the response to an event that was canceled and how people still turned out to come see the tulips and some of the heartburn and concerns that that brought in the, in the community. Okay, Dave, back to you. Okay, so like Jeff said, the, the two events that are here is the Tulip Festival and Abate. Um, so contrary to the event, uh, the Tulip Festival, the Abate Rally did go on. So when Beth called and asked us to present on these, uh, she wanted to have the two, uh, you know, the, the spectrum of it, the events that went on uh, and the event that, that didn't happen. So um, I think through both the events, we're gonna be able to share some lesson learned um, and Go with that. Um, so the planning for uh, for our event uh, that we normally have, you know, we worry about having having planning in place for security, uh, obviously uh, for our different businesses in town, uh, weather event. Every year, without you know, with without exception, there's all there's a severe weather event that comes through that Fourth of July weekend. Normally we see uh, straight line winds come through. So um, it's really kind of interesting to see how people scramble, how they take shelter in an event, you know, area like this. Um, so we, we do plan uh, pretty hard for the weather type event. Uh, medical emergencies, uh, we end up transporting EMS wise, uh, somewhere around 75 people in emergent situations come into our local hospital and do uh, end up being transferred out. The first aid station uh, sees anywhere from 500 to 700 uh, patients throughout the weekend for minor burns, abrasions, um, sutures, things like that. 
Uh, and then obviously we have the increased traffic uh, that's here in the area. Um, a lot of the traumatic events that happen are due to traffic accidents and uh, are mostly on our, our intersection of Highway 18 and Highway 169 uh, is where they occur. Uh, we do have some legal and investigation issues um, that tie right in with the next item on, the, on that list is the motorcycle clubs. We do have an influx of uh, like the DCI, uh, US Marshals and uh, the FBI that do come in uh, to Kasuth County and um, operate some investigative procedures uh, throughout trying to um, uh, do the thing they can do. So we are truly doing a, a multi-jurisdictional response or multi-jurisdictional activities with them. Uh, some of the other things that we're dealing with during a, a regular uh, abate weekend would be foodborne illnesses. Um, we know out there at the park that people are uh, not necessarily having refrigerators to, to keep their food fresh, they're using coolers. Uh, so we do often have issues with that. And then the other events that are going on around the county, the parades, fireworks, so we have dirt track races that'll go on that weekend and then tractor rides. So it's, it's kind of like when we knew that we were gonna start having a bait here, everybody decided since we have the influx of people, let's just go ahead and pour fuel on that fire um, and have more events, more traffic and, and keep that going. So normally we start to plan for the abate rally uh, in early April of the year so that we could just kind of discuss, you know, what's the chatter that you're hearing about the different motorcycle clubs that are coming. Um, and when we talk about motorcycle clubs, we're, we're meaning like the Hells Angels, Sons of Silence, um, the Banditos, uh, clubs like that. Uh, so we do try to, to stay up on that and hear their chatter. Those clubs uh, do try to register for the event early on. Um, so that the rally is prepared for that and they can segregate those campgrounds. Now this year, a little bit different, obviously. So event planning for 2020, you know, on top of all the stuff that we were planning for already, we needed to plan for obviously increased PPE, uh, increased uh, medical issues or potential for that, our shelters, supply management, uh, community spread and testing, um, and then again, the civil unrest issues that we were having. You know, we acknowledged early on that, that the Abate Freedom Rally is just that, it's freedom. So during these times of the civil unrest that we were seeing around the world uh, and really, you know, straight north of us in Minneapolis, these motorcycle enthusiasts, they weren't gonna stop flying their Confederate flags. They weren't gonna stop um, you know, fly in their colors. They were gonna gonna keep doing what they were doing, because that is their right. And we heard that we heard that many many times. It's our right to do that, and we're not going to stop. Um, so when we do that planning uh, early on, we were looking at. at the shelter areas that we had and how we could do social distancing. And ultimately what we ended up doing on that is which is the higher risk, the need to, to slow the spread or the need for shelter from the storm. And we opted for the shelter of the storm. If they need a place, safe place to go, that's where they're going. Uh, when it came to the medical, every year uh, we send our, our incident command trailer out to the park and they work uh, an extra five bed first aid station out of there. So they have their on site five bed first aid, and then we provide a five bed first aid that our, our EMS units can respond out of. And then we send a, a paramedic unit out there that, that hangs out uh, throughout the rally so they could provide um, IV fluids for dehydration, um, IV fluids, oxygen, um, and D50 so that they can really help sober people up uh, and let them go on with their day. This year we opted not to do that. We didn't want to jeopardize the health and safety of our EMS crews. Uh, so we did send out uh, our command trailer for that five bed unit, uh, but we did not send an ambulance out there this year, which was really beneficial for us because the, with the ambulance not being out there, you know, we, we didn't transport anybody out of the park this year. There wasn't one ambulance call out there. So I don't know if people were just behaving or we just didn't identify the illnesses. Um, 
uh, again with traffic flow, uh, you know, as to be predicted with with increased traffic. I touched on the investigation, legal aspects. Um, so, you know, this year was was not a whole lot different from the planning. We started that first conversation uh, with the abate leadership uh, again in April um, and had the conversations. With that first conversation, <coughs> they informed us that come hell or high water, we're holding this event. It's our right. It's our freedom. Nothing has been said that, that really says that we can't hold it. So we had um, some real pleasant exchanges with them, uh, sending the governor's proclamations back and forth to them, uh, indicating, well, here's, here's law. You're not going to have your, your open venue, your concert venue, your bars, your, your things like that. So we really had some real frank conversations. Um, and then really, uh, really once we started those conversations and, and gave our position, they gave their position, um, then our relationships really got kind of, we really got strong. Um, we've never had a problem with the bait leadership before. And, and, you know, the communication is, is the key aspects. Um, as things progressed, uh, progressed with the reopening of events, the, the governor opening our, our venues, um, things like that. And then the, the civil unrest that we were seeing around the U S this initiated additional conversations with the Sooth County Board of Health, local elected officials, um, the governor's office, uh, and Homeland Security. We initiated that conversation with this very brief email. And uh, I think anybody that has ever been in an email exchange with me, uh, or even a conversation, I don't like to beat around the bush. I'm just gonna put out there what my thought is, what my issue is, and then please respond to that. So this was uh, intended for the governor's office as she was uh, reducing restrictions, opening things up. And um, in a reply conversation later, uh, it was this email again, that we've got 10 to 15 bikers coming to participate in sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And that's what they're gonna be. Uh, I ended the conversation by, we have a small sheriff's office, a 10 officer, department and 10 officers uh, in our city enforcement, it's going to take the National Guard to tell these guys they have to shut down and how we're going to enforce that. So the purpose of this email and this conversation was really just to, to help maintain situational awareness and, and to keep that conversation going um, as we needed, needed the governor's office to be aware of this major event that was coming that, that not a lot of people know is here. So uh, you know, as you guys all know that the, the restrictions were loosened up, the outdoor venues were opened up. Um, and we thought, really, we thought we were free and clear. You know, the base says they're moving forward and it's, it's gonna be a good time for them. This is awesome. Well, the next issue happened where the abate notified us and said our insurance company dropped us. You know, they don't want the liability of having um, transmission here. So what do we do? And we said, we don't care. We don't care what you do, figure it out. So needless to say, they, we, they held the event, they found another insurance company uh, that was covering them, but that insurance company had some very specific restrictions for them. And one of them was they cannot bring, attendees cannot bring outside liquor in. They could bring beer in, but they can't bring liquor into the park. So that created some tension, uh, but they didn't find a way that they could buy their liquor on ground. So they got a liquor license. Uh, High V Wine and Spirits was uh, really good to, you know, able to provide them. Um, and then they, they came back and wanted to have a conversation with us. They as in a bait. What are your expectations? You know, and, and the Board of Health, uh, Public Health, uh, ha and myself, we had some very frank conversations with them again about our expectations are that you encourage people to, to make limited trips into town to not go into town in large groups or not enter stores in large groups. Um, and, and they were very receptive of that. The abated administration leadership passed that on for months and uh, that went very well. But here's the thing, you guys, I, I didn't anticipate, and I should have, I didn't anticipate the, the mess on top of the mess. I thought our mess was how are we gonna enforce abate 
to abide by the governor's procs and how are we going to shut it down if we have to. I didn't fully, nor did my, my partners here locally, we didn't anticipate the outcry from our local communities. You're inviting 10,000 people or you're okay with allowing 10,000 people to come into our cities from around the United States to spread whatever they have. And, you know, immediately our response was, was this. Just because you perceive that these bikers are dirty bikers doesn't mean that that's what they are. A very small number of them are the dirty gangster bikers. The majority of them are business owners, are physicians, are lawyers, are uh, running trucking services that are multi-million dollar operations. These are respectful people. Um, so so we, you know, we tried to put, put at ease. Uh, so we ended up doing um, a media, kind of a media blitz on social media, uh, working with our local media outlets and you know, really just kind of indicating that, yeah, we don't, we don't have any authority to tell them they can't come, it's on private property, we can't close roads, um, and, and it's gonna happen. If you're not comfortable, we, you know, be vigilant, keep your social distancing, stock up on your needed stuff ahead of time, but, you know, this is, this is what it is. So we, uh, you know, we thought we were ahead of the game on that, but um, we ran into some, some other issues um, with that. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that in the lesson learned. So I'll kick it back to Jeff um, to kind of discuss how their decisions were made with the Tulip Festival. Thanks, Dave. So uh, in a normal year, the planning for the uh, Pella Tulip Festival starts in uh, February. And we conduct monthly meetings, um, up, you know, three monthly meetings up you know, pre, uh, pre event, um, as I said earlier, which the event takes place the first weekend in May. Um, we've done this enough where we can typically capture everything we need to uh, create the event action plan um, without too much ado. Uh, there's typically very few changes. Um, we have the three meetings to capture any changes in personnel or things, changes within the community that we need to plan for. So we were well on that road this year. Uh, we obviously knew that uh, COVID was making an impact in the world. Um, we gave it a little bit of discussion, um, but in the end, the decision was made, we've got a plan for the event to take place and then kind of that prepare for the worst and hope for the best kind of thing. So we'd actually um, had our first two meetings um, this year and we're in progress of a draft EAP that would have been shared with everybody on the planning committee at the uh, April meeting. So that's where we were. Um, as I said earlier, we went in, in Marion County, we went into kind of full COVID response that second week in May, um, somewhere between the 9th and the 10th, or I'm sorry, in March, in the 9th to the 10th. And on the 17th, this, uh, the Tulip Festival Steering Committee canceled the event for 2020. We were involved in a couple of those meetings, um, primarily just Q and A, uh, answering their questions, trying to help them navigate the waters the steering committee in Pella is made up of various social groups or various civic, civic groups um, representative from the city. Um, in, in all honesty, my office has had a hard time interacting with the steering committee because the steering committee changes. So it's been, uh, it's taken some concerted efforts over my 12 years here to get a relationship built with that steering committee. We were able to do that a few years ago um, because we actually had a severe weather event. Um, so that made it much easier and we kind of build on those, build on that progress since. So in 2020, we were in pretty good standing with the uh, steering committee and in a good position to help them. So we were able to bring the Board of Health and the, and the Public Health Director in and do a couple meetings with them, 
as they tried to make a decision on what to do with the event for 2020. They needed to make a decision fairly early because the amount of food that the vendors needed to order, the, their, their timelines for ordering were somewhere between the 20th of March and the, the 1st of April. So they needed to know very soon. And that, that kind of moved up our timeline. Um, it kind of erased the ability to wait, take a wait and see approach and make a decision as the event, the date of the event got closer. Um, so what happened was they canceled the event, as I said, on March 17th. Um, we were in full blown COVID response mode, did not have uh, much to offer them for resources for planning of now what's going to happen in the community. Um, we did have weekly conference calls with them in addition to a, a weekly conference call with all of our mayors and we had significant conversations with them about um, what their options were within the community. Um, there were civic groups that expected the police department, the Pella Police Department, to essentially shut down all the ramps and not allow any visitors into the city. And of course, the, the, the tulips turned out to be, the timing of the tulips was impeccable this year. They were in pretty much in full bloom when the festival was slated to happen. It's a very difficult conversation to have with some of your local folks where you tell them we don't have the resources or the ability to shut off the city. Um, that's what, you know, kind of as Dave said about the abate rally, it's the freedom. It's the freedom to move out in, in the United States and the freedom to drive from, a, from one town to another and, and see the sights and the sounds. Um, the other thing that I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this in a way that you'll it'll make sense to you. Um, during one of our weekly conference calls with uh, the ste steering committee, um, it was actually a Zoom call, and I brought a weed eater to the meeting with me. Um, and it was an attempt by me to be funny, um, and it was funny for about 15 seconds. And then the reality that that was one of their options was to essentially weed eat or remove all the tulips. And then in, at least in theory, uh, visitors would not come to town. Um, in the end, uh, they decided to let the business, the individual business owners who were going to either have the most to gain or the most to lose by having visitors in the community, go ahead and let them make a individual decision on how they wanted to handle the influx or potential influx of visitors within their businesses. So that's kind of the, the planning, um, the pre-planning and then the, the planning after the cancellation. So Dave, I'll go back to you. All right, so I think, I think Jeff touched on something, something very good there. And you know, I know those of you that have been in this profession for a long, long, time you're seasoned um, have probably caught on way quicker than I have um, but often when we have our attempt to be humorous it suddenly becomes not as funny to your, to ourselves anymore so um, I have fallen into that uh, myself um, so let's roll into the lesson learned portion um, you know, as I touched on before, one of the one of the things that happened and that we didn't anticipate was the significant outcry from from our citizens. Um, and this is something that that really caught me off guard. I knew that we would have a little bit of an you know a little bit of an issue with some concern, but not the way I thought that it happened. And I thought we were addressing it. So I'm, I want to read a letter to you that, that circulated and was sent to not just myself or the mayor or the elected officials, but this letter and letters similar to this went to every media outlet in the state of Iowa, state of Minnesota, and the state of South Dakota. This went to our state elected officials um, as well as our, our local officials. So again, this is 
letters like this came from our, our local physicians, came from citizens, came from uh, dentists, came from uh, there's some law enforcement that, that sent it. So I want to read this to you. Good morning. I'm deeply concerned about the upcoming Abate of Iowa Freedom Rally at the address of 2536 160th Avenue, Algona. This rally will occur July 2nd through the 4th, 2020. It's expected to bring 5,000 to 10,000 people from all over the United States. To it. My wife is 70 years old. My daughter is quadruple quadrilopegic, I didn't pronounce that right, and is 40 years old. I am 68 years old with breathing conditions. As of June 22nd, 2020, Iowa has 26,051 people test positive of COVID-19 and 686 deaths. Kasuth County has 23 people tested positive of COVID-19, no deaths at this time. Hancock County has 37 with no deaths. What preparations are being made to protect people attending the Abate of Iowa Freedom Rally at this address? What preparations are being made to protect essential workers in Kasuth County? Those would include grocery stores, gas stations, etc. Is the governor aware of this event and is she planning to provide testing for people attending the 2020 Abate Rally? And will essential workers and citizens of Kasuth and Hancock counties have access to COVID-19 testing during and after the Abate of Iowa Freedom Rally, July 2nd through the 4th, 2020, from COVID-19? Sincerely, this person. And then he provided uh, about 10 attachments of statistics uh, for the state uh, and the nation uh, of how COVID-19 uh, COVID is growing. We <clears throat> chose not to respond directly to, to these individuals. Um, we you know, did our, our press releases and, and things of that sort. Um, almost immediately when we discovered that these letters were sent out, we noticed an uptick in media requests. And we, we started out by doing individual interviews, which eventually became uncontrollable. The media was calling two, three times a day, the same, same outlet calling two, three times a day, wanting an interview, wanting to meet with different people. One of the lessons that I learned through this is that even though I have a very experienced PIO who, who works in media, uh, or has worked in media and was very comfortable in front of the camera, he immediately felt overwhelmed and wasn't comfortable speaking the, and I'm air quoting, propaganda that was being put out. He immediately transferred the calls back to the EOC, um, back to the JIC, and uh, we had to feel those calls, those conversations out of the EOC. I apologize if there's any media that is on this, uh, this Zoom, this presentation, but I will say I, I found very rapidly that media will only take the bits and pieces they want to tie into their story. So I've, I've lost complete trust in the media. When I started early on, they said they could be your, your biggest, um, biggest proponent, be your biggest support, your best um, way to get information out, or they can hurt you more than anything. Uh, and as much as we try to continue to feed these outlets the information that they wanted, they would take a, a two minute interview and take three seconds out of it um, and it would go south. So with, with the letters that went out, we did uh, begin working with uh, the governor's office and Homeland Security. Uh, immediately, we were able to secure a Test Iowa site to come to Kasuth County, um, uh, which is still up and running. We were able to have that Test Iowa site operational, I think, July 8th. Uh, so we were able to uh, wait that incubation period from the rally and then started testing. To date, um, there has been no reported COVID transmissions that came out of the Abate Freedom Rally. When we started the test Iowa site, <clears throat> we, public health was able to track 
the positive cases that we were seeing in Kasuth County back to the lakes. Sorry, Eric. Um, so we were tracking it back there, but nothing that came from the Abate Freedom Rally. So we were able, you know, really those people that came back to us and, and fought with us, you know, we were able to kind of thumb our nose and say we did everything we could. One of the other things that we did, uh, in addition to securing the Test Iowa site here, we, uh, our local elected officials um, put forth some money. We're purchasing additional PPE as they could find to provide to the gas stations, uh, grocery stores. Uh, we were able to support them uh, throughout Kasuth County um, and then uh, provided hand sanitizer to be dispensed, uh, distributed at the races uh, and the, the parades, fireworks, uh, things of that sort. Um, so some of that being lesson learned, um, it, it's still ongoing, um, still learning lessons every day uh, from this event um, and still uh, to the credit of the media outlets that burned me, uh, I've received phone calls from them apologizing uh, and admitting that, you know, we received these letters and we had a story going on it and you didn't, you didn't speak what we wanted to hear to go with the story. And I, so I uh, apologize for that and they're trying to make amends and, and I'm open for that relationship again. So Jeff, lesson learn, learned for you. By far the, the biggest lesson um, that we learned here and thankfully we, it was not a painful one was the critical nature of the relationship and communication when you have an event um, such as a pan, the COVID pandemic going on um, as it overlaps on your local annual event. Um, we're very fortunate that we have a, had a good relationship with, with the mayor and city council, um, with my office, as well as the board of supervisors, because what happened was in, within the community was once the event was canceled, once people started showing up to visit Pella, regardless, because the tulips were in bloom, um, the media helped propagate that by continuing to run news stories on the amount of people coming to Pella and how beautiful the tulips were. So I echo your comments. The, the media is, is, I'll just say something else to deal with. Um, but what happened was the, the local residents within the city, once they got frustrated with their city leadership, they began to call my office. They began to try and make contact with the Board of Supervisors in the hope that somebody would step in and do something more than the city of Pella leadership. And as I said, uh, thank God for the good relationship and the good communication between all of those parties because um, they stayed, they stayed together uh, with their messaging. They stayed together step by step and, and took a few body shots on, on the way through, um, but came out on the other side. Um, so I guess that's our biggest lesson learned was the, those critical relationships um, that are strong enough to stand, withstand um, a few of those body blows. Because um, frankly, we were taking graphic and almost obscene phone calls from, from folks. Um, had an elderly lady um, screaming at me that um, she was going to call me 24-7 when if she saw visitors urinating in her yard because um, the most of the public restrooms were closed. And obviously with the event being canceled, there was no portable toilets. So she was concerned that with the, the influx, the big influx of visitors coming to view the tulips and no toilets, that people were going to be standing in her yard urinating. And she was going to call me and give me another piece of her mind. So that was kind of the first one that got my attention that um, there, there's some hostility there and it's really about flowers to, you know, to put it simply. Um, so that's kind of our big lesson learned. Um, there's just not a lot else you can do. Um, no matter how hard you try to tell people you can't shut your city down to outsiders, there's always going to believe some, some are always going to believe that you should and you can. And it's just a matter of whether you will or not. 
Thank you, Dave. If I'd have known that peeing around uh, the tulips was, was an option, I'd have done that a long time ago, Jeff, just so you could get the results. Yeah, it caught me off guard. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions that, that I got texted to me is what, uh, what measures did a, did a bait take for their event? And I, I will put this out right away, right off the bat. Um, so a bait has been here in Kasuth County uh, for about 20 years. They were down in Humboldt County before they uh, were able to secure this private property uh, and be free up here. I will say for the, the 19, 20 years that they've been in Kasuth County, a bait has been nothing but a pleasure to work with. They have been supportive of the community, community events, um, making donations back to our, our public safety entities, um, helping to raffle off bikes for our, our law enforcement, uh, things like that. So a bait is, is incredible to work with. I think uh, anybody that's holding an event um, uh, would be lucky to have them. I'll say I, I would take a summer long abate over a, a, an overnight of rag right any day. So the things that abate did, um, they, they really followed the guidance that was put out by, by Iowa Department of Public Health uh, and the CDC. Uh, they did temperature checking of everybody coming in that was buying a wristband. All their staff had temperature checks daily, uh, if not twice a day coming and going. Uh, they placed plexiglass at all of their vendor stations so that there was that, that limited space. They had uh, hand sanitizer stations placed uh, around each stage in each bar area. Um, and they did uh, make arrangements to have alcoholic beverages sold on site as to limit the exposure uh, within the communities. They did post many, many signs around their park uh, wear masks, uh, if you're sick, do not enter. Um, these COVID signs, they, they place these eight by 12 signs. Uh, and then they made announcements over their, their PA system at a regular, uh, you know, regular basis, uh, as well as offering um, temperature checks in multiple locations throughout the day. Um, so they, you know, they did um, work very, very good. And, you know, I wonder, and I'd, I'd love to volunteer for a little research project, but knowing how much alcohol was consumed at the rally and knowing that there was no positive cases tied to the rally, I think that the amount of alcohol consumed probably limits or kills the virus. So I would be up for um, participating in that experiment. Just saying, if anybody from public health is there. Um, but uh, in closing before uh, questions, uh, if there are any, uh, I just wanna say that there are many things that I would choose to do before experiencing this type of event ever again. You know, there's, there's a million things. Uh, a prostate exam from the doctor with the biggest hands ever, razor blades to the eyes, clowns and wells, anything other than experiencing this again. Jeff? I, what can I add to that? You hit it out of the park. Um, I hope that 2021 is a better year for all of us. Um, no, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to some a normalcy, if you will. I appreciate everybody taking time out of your schedules to, to listen to us talk about these, these two events. All right, if, uh, I don't know, Blake, how you wanted to open this up for questions. I don't yep. see any questions. No problem. Um, you can either chat your questions in the chat area, or if you raise your hand, I will unmute you. Uh, so we do have about six minutes remaining. If there are any questions, we can hang on the line for just a second and see if there are any questions. I am not seeing anything at this point. I'm fine with that. So I would say thank you everybody for your patience. And uh, again, oh, somebody. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Daryl, Robert. Um, so thanks everybody for being patient with us. You know, again, I know we're preaching to the choir and uh, I will reiterate uh, what I said at the beginning, and I know Jeff would say the same thing. 
I thank everybody in my district and surrounding district for uh, supporting me through through this event. Uh, I had a lot of questions and um, tried to pass off all of my PO acti PIO activities onto Steve O'Neill. So um, it was it was very nice to have the support and know that um, I not only have my my district partners uh, but the state right there with me. So thank you all for that. All right, and I'm still not seeing any questions come in. Perfect. I'd say early lunch. Next session's at 1.30, right? All right, well, I will go ahead and stop the recording and the, uh, the presentation then. Thank you. Thank you.